Hi, welcome. I'm Marissa Holiday with the Indian Wells Arts Festival, and you are joining us for another episode of Behind the Canvas. Today, we have an extraordinary guest, the very talented Los Angeles-based artist, David Palmer, who um, not only is receiving um, critical acclaim for his extraordinary pop art fused Italian Renaissance painting style, but also collectors uh, around the world. Um, in addition to his many accolades and awards, David is our 2017 Indian Wells Arts Festival commemorative artist. So David, thank you for joining us today. I see you're in your studio. I am, I mean, I'm here uh, working, taking a little break. <laughs> Well, I'm so thrilled to talk with you. Um, we've kind of had a busy week, and uh, one of the things that we did with you last week is we unveiled uh, the 48 by 36 original acrylic painting, which serves as our commemorative print for 2017, Desert Dreaming. And I kind of see it over there behind your shoulder. Yeah, I'll give you a close up as we're, as we're talking. Awesome, how was that unveiling? Was it fun? It was fun. Yeah, I met the mayor and, uh, you know, the city council and, you know, they, they pulled off the cloth and uh, people seemed to really like it. And then we all went out to lunch. Yes, yes. It's, I have to tell you that the, the painting is extraordinary. I mean, there's so much color in it and it just captures um, all of these elements of, the, of our desert, the Coachella Valley, um, that we sometimes miss as we're driving through or running by or cycling by. Sometimes we don't catch the color of the flora or uh, even the fine details in the quill. And you have just done an extraordinary job with that. And uh, that painting and the commemorative print, uh, even though we have about a month to go before the show, is so well received that people are already placing their orders for those prints. So kudos to you. It's an amazing painting. Oh, thanks so much. I'm really glad people are, are getting the print. Uh, it, was a, it was a lot of fun to do the painting. T tell us a little bit about uh, what inspired you for Desert Dreaming and maybe about some of the aspects that um, you enjoy about that painting uh, the most. Okay, well, it, um, I was invited to create it for the show and for the poster. And I've been coming out to the desert a little bit over this past year, but of course I usually would just drive out there and the desert was just what was along the side of the road. Um, when I started working on the painting, I realized I needed to get out into the desert and start looking more carefully at what was going on. And the, the, the first time I did that was the middle of the summer where it was very hot and everything was kind of dormant. <laughs> and <laughs> so, you know, I couldn't really find a lot of plant life blooming or, you know, a few little animals running around. But as I, as I kept coming out there and the seasons changed, I saw a transformation. And it was like going into a dream. It was almost like uh, the Wizard of Oz when she, you know, wakes up and everything's in color. And um, there was a, there's a dreamlike quality to that, to that the way that the desert changes from one state to another. Well, it's it's definitely incredible, and I know that you uh, you visited the Living Desert and even went off some of the. Uh, uh, not so beaten trails to find uh, some of your inspiration. Uh, there's so much color in that painting. And I know that that's one of your signature styles is lots and lots of vibrant color. Um, tell us a little bit about the palette that you used for the painting. Okay, well, my color, I'm basically a pop artist with an Italian Renaissance influence. So um, between the two things, um, there was a lot of color, especially in the later Renaissance, coming into people's work as paints got better and they started looking more at nature. And with pop art, what you're, what you're dealing with usually is taking things that exist in our day-to-day -day environment and taking them out of context. So it'd be like, you know, Jasper Johns painting a flag, but he transforms it into something and Andy Warhol painting soup cans or Marilyn Monroe and transforming them into other things. And a lot of that was the color palette and a lot of it was taking something and making it into not just a direct experience, but also an icon, an icon of that kind of experience, like the ultimate soup can, the ultimate you know, picture of Elvis or something. And in a way that's what I'm doing with the things that are in my paintings, including in this painting, that I'm taking things from my day-to-day -day experience and I'm taking them out of the setting that they were in and I'm making them into an iconic image that that is um it stands for what it is rather than just being a natural view of it 
if that makes any sense. Yes. Yes, it does. And I want to I want to um, bring the audience in a little bit on your background, because while you you are a very well established Los Angeles, California based artist, you're actually from most. And when we've spoken before, you've mentioned that some of the influence uh, for your paintings comes from your childhood and your memories of the things that brought you joy or made a, made a big impression on you. Tell us a little bit about your, uh, your background and how you got out to California. Sure, well, I grew up in a little town in upstate New York on the Pennsylvania border. And when I was a kid, my friends and I would go wandering out into the fields and the streams and we'd catch snakes and turtles and, um, you know, build forts and, you know, just out and climb trees, fall out of trees. And so a lot of it was came from an early direct contact with nature and just a fascination with um, the ways that I can interact with it. Like for instance, in the summers, the creek down the, down the hill from our house used to dry up and it would form into these little pools and fish would get trapped in the pools and we could actually catch fish with our hands, just, you know, reach in and grab them. So it was kind of <laughs> wanting to recapture that magic of um, direct experience with nature or um, I've done a lot of series of just the things I used to eat when I was a kid, like hostess cupcakes and, um, you know, some of the toys that I had. So a lot of it's trying to, um, I guess, re-engage with that, that feeling of discovering something when you're a kid, when you're not jaded to it and you're not super busy all the time, you're just engaged with things very directly without time constraints. Mm -hmm. And so then you went to art school I did. I started, I mean, I've been drawing and painting my whole life. Um, when I was in, you know, sixth grade, I had a, a, an art teacher that suggested I take a summer class with her because, you know, she thought I had something, I don't know. And I switched from crayons to oil paint and I just kept going. So I've, I'm basically self-taught, but I also have undergraduate and graduate degrees in painting as well. Well, I, I love that you mention um, and acknowledge your your sixth grade teacher because that's something that's so important. Sometimes missing in our schools is the, are the art programs and the encouragement to pursue um, those creative avenues. And so I just I just want to commend you for acknowledging her, and uh, hopefully we'll see more of those art programs back in the schools. And if not, there are um, lots of wonderful programs in uh, most communities. And all you really need to do is reach out to some of your nonprofit centers. And if they don't have an art program, they certainly can direct you to that. You might just have a young David Palmer under your roof who just needs that, that little push of encouragement to pursue that creative uh, aspect. Well, all I can say so is then, be very careful of that kid. <laughs> then, then you went, so you went to uh, graduate school, you finished um, your studies with art, and then you came out to the West Coast. Tell me about that journey. Okay, well, I loaded everything I had into an old Toyota Corolla station wagon, my paintings, my art supplies, and whatever clothes I had, and I drove across the country. And when I got to California, I had a brother and a sister who had moved out here before me, so I had a place to stay. And my car lasted about three weeks when I was here, and then it just died. And I took <laughs> off the license plates and left it by the side of the road and got a bicycle. And I spent my first year here living down in an apartment at Venice Beach and just riding my bike everywhere. And then, you know, within a few months, I was getting shows here and um, just kind of went from there. Well, I have to say that if you're going to land in California as an artist, Venice Beach might be the most interesting place <laughs> to start out. I mean, there is just something to look at no matter what direction you turn in. What were some of yeah. your favorite things uh, out at Venice Beach? Well, actually, I started off doing a whole series of Venice Beach paintings. Um, when I first came out here, I was doing these kind of dream images of people flying or, you know, a girl holding a tornado in her hand, They're sort of dream images that were, um, that had a magic to them. And if you go down to Venice Beach, it has that same otherworldly kind of feeling with people's costumes and, you know, rollerblading by. And so I did a whole series of paintings based on the Venice boardwalk, but there were people flying by in the air and there were, you know, dogs and characters and stuff that just uh, populated it. And it felt a little bit almost like an old Renaissance painting, but it was also Venice Beach. <laughs> yes. So 
So somewhere along the line, um, you got involved in the film industry as a digital effects artist. And uh, our viewers may or may not know, David is, uh, if you haven't seen his paintings in person, you are probably familiar with his work and have seen it at some point in time because the films that he's worked on are box office hits ranging from Air Force One with Harrison Ford to The Polar Express. And of course, my personal favorite as a geek, geek, geek till the end, uh, Harry Potter. Tell us about your experience working in the film industry because you were you kind of um, worked in that industry when digital effects was at at a very innovative turning point. So tell us about your experience with that. Well, basically, I came out to California to get involved in the art scene and had no interest in working on movies, even though I like watching movies. And at one point, I was juggling various things, trying to make a living, and you know, I was selling some artwork and I was doing some. Um, set painting for you know for commercials and stuff but it was all just kind of bits and pieces and a friend of mine suggested i look into computer graphics because i had the art skills that a lot of the people that were good at computers back then didn't have yet so i talked some friends of mine into let me come into their little production studio at night and use the max they weren't using and i taught myself photoshop and a couple of other things and within a year i was working on uh, air force one which was amazing you know and so in doing that, you ended up somehow coming back to your first love on the canvas. And you and I have, have chatted about this a little bit before, but I'd love to talk about um, how creating digital effects, how going from oils and acrylics to then creating digital effects and translating art in the digital realm and then coming back to that canvas, how all of those steps and stages throughout your career may have influenced some of the paintings that we see you presenting today. Well, it actually kind of set me on an interesting journey because as much as I loved working on the movies, it was always a day job for me. So I would work long hours creating, you know, photorealistic airplanes or three-headed dogs or whatever. And then I would go get something to eat and go to my studio and paint. And what I found was that when I first came out to California, my paintings were very, very realistic. And as I was working all day on the computer, creating photorealistic images for the films, I found that when I went to the studio, I wanted to do more abstract work. So I actually started moving away from the things I was doing during the day, just so that it didn't feel like I was doing the same thing. And I went through a long period when I was working on, um, I, I created this whole series of aerial views of the earth um, that were made out of cut out linoleum. They weren't even paint. And um, other things where it was purely abstract imagery. And then eventually over time, I started missing representation. But when I came back to painting more realistically, some of those abstract elements work their way in. And I found myself breaking up the surfaces more, distorting the colors, um, taking things out of their environment. So it changed it, but almost, almost by pushing me away from what I was doing, and I came back to it in a new way. So I, I think a really good example of this, not just because I happen to absolutely love desert dreaming, but it really is, I think, a great example of what you're talking about. Maybe if you'll walk us over to the painting, um, I'd like the viewers to get a chance to see that, that blend because <clears throat> Desert Dreaming has this wonderful abstract uh, feel with the with the flowers and the background and the cactus. And then when we, you know, sort of pan down a little bit to the quail, the quail has this kind of like uh, old masters uh, style to it. And it's just, it's an incredible, incredible blend of technique and style. And I'm going to actually center the camera now on uh, that painting because I see you're showing it off. Tell us a little bit about the details and, and the layers of this painting and how you created it. Okay, well, first of all, normally when I paint, I will get an idea. I'll do some really, really quick thumbnail sketches in a journal just to explore it. And then I'll go out and shoot photographs and I'll compose the painting on the canvas. But for this one, I was invited to do this piece for you know, a client, which was uh, the arts festival. And so I had to submit sketches. And I went through a lot of stages where I would sketch something out, send it in, get feedback on it, um, make some changes, 
and send them off again. So I ended up with this painting knowing a lot more what it was going to look like when it was finished than I normally do, because usually I start off in a direction and I just explore it. Um, the quail itself is actually suggested by Diane Funk, who's the head of the um, Indian Wells Arts Festival, as something to try out. And it ended up actually transforming the painting. First, first I was just doing plant life with this. And I ended up treating the quail almost like a, um, a traditional Renaissance portrait of royalty or something in the profile and has a very regal look to him. Um, the plants are, as you can see, just like flowering uh, cactus and smoke plants and some other plants from the desert. I, they, are, they already have a lot of good natural color to them, but I, of course, enhance that a lot because that's part of what I do when I paint is transform things. So, uh, David, I have to say, I have to jump in here and say that in my 10 years plus of living in the desert, um, of course, this smoke tree is uh, native to the desert. And uh, wherever you travel in the Coachella Valley, especially if there's a little bit more of a, a rural off beaten area, you will find uh, smoke tree plants. But in my decade plus of living there, I had actually never seen the smoke tree bloom. And I was just absolutely stunned at how beautiful it was and how colorful it was and how fortunate of you to find that smoke tree in bloom. It's just lovely. Well, I did a lot of digging around and I also got a lot of feedback from people that know the desert a lot better than I do. And um, it was a process. I can actually show you the sketch if you're curious to see that. Yeah, we'd love to see that. Let me let me, let me switch the camera around here. So there we go. All right. So the sketch actually went through a few stages. I don't know if you can see that pretty well in your yeah, screen. Yeah, it looks great. Okay, so now that's the original sketch. And with that one, the quail was pretty big. And after some feedback, I decided to make the quail smaller so that it fit into the landscape better. So I, I do my drawing, these drawings in Photoshop so that I can work in layers, move things around. I'm using a tablet, um, so it's basically like drawing on paper, but I'm actually using an electronic device. Very cool. Now, here's something, here's a very special treat uh, for all of the viewers and everybody who will be attending uh, the festival, as well as anybody out there from any corner of the world that wants to participate. David has turned his painting into a coloring sheet so that we all have the opportunity to take his sketch and to lend our own interpretation uh, with, the, with the colors in the background. And you can find that coloring sheet uh, on the Indian Wells Arts Festival website at indianwellsartsfestival.com. It's just a simple download, or we'll have those coloring sheets at the festival that uh, you can take on. Now, David, here's something I want to share with you. I just found this out yesterday. Uh, a, a delivery of one of the posters of Desert Dreaming was made, and upon that delivery, uh, we found that individual's granddaughter coloring that color sheet already. So she was already Great. kind of putting her own spin on a David Palmer painting. That was so cool. I love that. And I it, mean, one of the things I'm, look I'm looking forward to is seeing what people do with that because, you know, they don't have the color reference that I do or, you know, the idea that I started with, they have just a drawing and I'm really curious to see how they transform that. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really neat, and it's a it's wonderful to be able to have your beautiful painting for reference, but then also, you know, giving people to um, have permission to you know present their own interpretation of it or uh, follow uh, in your footsteps. So I think that's really cool, and we'll see more of that uh, at the show, which is March 31st through April 1st and 2nd at the Indian Wells Tennis Garden. David, of course, is our featured artist, so he will be there with Desert Dreaming, which will be available um, uh, for a collector if they're interested in it. I suggest uh, if you are, you might want to put dibs on it now because it's just, it's gorgeous and uh, anybody who sees it is just is stunned by its beauty so I'm not sure that it's going to be available for long but if you're interested make sure you put um, put your note in about that uh, last year was your first year participating at the festival is that right David it was yeah it's uh, my first time there I'm actually kind of new at doing outdoor shows for years it was just galleries and museums and 
at a certain point, I started realizing that I wanted to just have more contact with the people that are actually seeing my work. And so I started doing these. Yeah, it's it's um, it's really neat uh, because coming to a festival like the Indian Wells Arts Festival, where the artist is there with their work, gives people an opportunity not only to see the artwork up close and in person, but to meet the artist and to talk about the technique. I mean, some collectors are really interested in the in the technical aspects of the painting and the skill set behind it. Some people, um, you know, purchase paintings based on I like it, it belongs in my home, it feels like it should be with. Me. Me, but that's really it creates this um, amazing opportunity to connect with that artist and that brings about a, a different kind of synergy for that piece of artwork what were some of your favorite uh, things about last year's show um, well, first of and, and oh, maybe if I can add on what are you looking forward to this year <laughs> um, I'm looking forward to uh, being out there and meeting everyone that comes out um, I like you know, talking with people about my work. And I'm actually always really interested in hearing what people see in it because a lot of the things that I'm painting are from my own memory and childhood. But what I find is that people will see the work and it will remind, something, remind them of something from their own past. And a lot of times they, they, um, they trigger things that have nothing to do with my own experience and I like hearing what theirs is. Um, last year I had a great time. I really loved the people. The venue is beautiful. And um, it's just a really fun few days. And the music was great last year, too. So, so last year, you brought out uh, your Hummingbird series, which uh, was so popular. I think it was like already sold out by the time you got your booth set up. Um, yeah. But I, you've got some new work. And while we have you in the studio, we've got about five minutes left with you. I'd love for you to give us a quick little tour of your studio and some of the paintings that you're working on uh, and what we might see out uh, at, at the festival with you this year. Great. I'll do that. I'll switch the camera around. And here we go. OK, I'm going to move slowly. So I do have some more hummingbirds. I've got three of them here. These are each one foot by one foot, they're little paintings. So David, I'm, I'm just gonna jump in here because um, I think our viewers would be interested in knowing that when you are working on a painting, um, that painting really kind of comes to life in layers. You, you create you know, layers at a time. And so that painting may take you um, many, many days to complete, but because you're working in layers, oftentimes those layers have to dry. So you'll move on to another painting while that the original layer is drying. So at any given point in time, is it safe to say that you might have four or five paintings in the works? Um, I do, and it's not even so much of draw as because of drying, because I switched from oils to acrylics so they would dry faster. And in fact, I usually have a paintbrush in one hand and a hair dryer in the other to dry these. <laughs> but I work on more than one at once because it lets me see them as a group and explore them in a different way than if I was just obsessively working on one piece. Um, here's something new that I'm doing is a series of these carousel horses, which were inspired originally by um, just my own childhood growing up in upstate New York and going to the amusement park. Here's another one down here that I just finished, if you can see ah, it. So beautiful. Um, and they're an old art form. They were, they were mo mostly created, uh, carved by hand between the 1880s and the 1930s. And then it kind of went away and there's a revived, just, uh, one my cows, I have a whole series of cow paintings. Um, I grew up around cows, not on a farm, but near them. And actually, uh, they're kind of pop art cows. Um, Andy Warhol did some cow wallpaper and I've actually been working with a company up in Toronto, some friends of mine making wallpaper and I've got a whole series of cow wallpaper. <laughs> Very cool. Let me just jump in here and tell folks that um, where where can they find you online if they were interested in some of these paintings or the wallpaper, um, where could they go online? Um, you can go to davidpalmerstudio.com. That's my website. Or if you forget that, you could just Google David Palmer Artist and I'll be right up at the top. And they can find you on Facebook and on Instagram. Facebook and Instagram. And actually you can link to both of those through my website. So if you want to go to the website first, then you can find links to Facebook and Instagram. Here's uh, some little crow paintings. Um, I always love crows. I think they're kind of 
these smart comical animals. And here is a picture inspired by my first art supplies. Yes. Crayola crayons. <laughs> From crayons to oils and then acrylic. <laughs> yeah, it's all just ways of making pictures. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate you letting us in your studio. I know it's it's a it's a private space, a creative space that sometimes uh, needs to be protected. But I think it's it's wonderful that you allowed us in, um, not only on your process but on your perspective um, with art. And I guess what I'd like to leave our viewers with today for anybody who is interested in art, pursuing art, becoming an artist, as from your journey as an artist, what what feedback, recommendations do you have for them? What advice would you give somebody who says, you know, I think I love art so much that I want to do it for the rest of my life. What what advice do you give them? Um, start right now. Don't wait. And you don't need permission. You don't need, you know, everyone thinks, oh, they need some sort of special training. Or I hear people say, well, I can't draw a straight line. If I want to draw a straight line, I use a ruler. So it's... Um, it really just comes from doing it. And if you have some natural talent that may come out, but it really comes from obsessively doing something that you love and just sticking with it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, David. Can't wait to see you. We're just like maybe six weeks away, six, six weeks away, I think. Technically this week, we're six weeks away from being out at the festival in the amazing Indian Wells, California at the state of the art Indian Wells uh, tennis garden um, and with 200 incredible artists. We have artists coming from over 25 different countries, uh, 20 different states across the nation and um, across 36 different mediums. So be sure to come out, uh, meet David, see his incredible paintings in person, find the one that speaks to you and take it home. <laughs> And um, don't forget to join us again uh, for the next podcast. You can keep up with us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Google Plus, and of course at IndianWellsArtsFestival.com. And we'll see you, David. And will your lovely wife uh, Judith be joining you? Will she be out there? She will be. She'll be there for part of it. I think the first day, anyway. She's working on some projects here at home, but she'll be there for part of it. So come out and meet me. Meet her meet you, Marissa. Um, so it's a great art show, so I hope to see everybody there. We'll see you guys March 31st through April 1 and 2 at the Indian Wells Arts Festival at the Indian Wells Tennis Garden. Thank you so much, David. See you there. Thank you.